and what we're going to do in the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, but first of all, uh, may I ask all attendees to please uh, not share this uh, webinar link uh, publicly, as is common for uh, for webinars like this. But uh, I would like to encourage you to please share um, everything else, really, that you uh, you hear, that you learn, that you wonder, that you want to discuss on social media. Um, for this, we have created a special hashtag. If you would like to use the hashtag EOE Roadshow for Eyes on Earth Roadshow, that's a hashtag that we'll be using for these two days to share everything we want to share about this, um, uh, about everything that's going on on this summit. So please feel free to take screenshots of things that you things that you find interesting, ask or answer any questions, provide additional information, um, share your ideas uh, with the world. Um, so hashtag. EOE Roadshow. Um, it was said this morning, uh, but just so we're aware of the background um, of this summit. Uh, the original plan, of course, was uh, to come together in the beautiful city of Zagreb, uh, the capital of Croatia, in the context of the current Croatian presidency of the Council of the European Union. Um, we're grateful to the local organizing team uh, to be flexible to change plans and turn this summit into one of the biggest online Earth observation events in Europe this year. Thank you. Uh, to all of you for joining this historic virtual event today and tomorrow. Now, let me introduce you um, to EO4GEO. Um, EO4GEO aims to bridge the skills gap between supply and demand of education and training in the earth observation and geospatial sectors. Fostering the uptake and integration of space data and services in a broad range of application domains. EO4GEO stimulates and promotes case-based and collaborative learning learning while doing in a living lab environment, on the job training and co-creation of knowledge, skills and competencies. And one of the key concepts that EO4GEO is developing um, is uh, a body of knowledge for Earth observation and geo information. And, and hopefully during this uh, panel and this summit uh, in general, we'll be able to uh, not just use the body of knowledge and benefit from the speakers, but also contribute to this body of knowledge um, in education uh, in job creation and all the other areas that I mentioned before. Um, the eu for geo Earth Observation Summit brings together representatives from academia, from business, from NGOs, from public sector involved in Earth observation and geo information. The goal of this summit is to look at future job profiles, education curricula, interconnections and tools in the Earth Observation domain, with a special focus on the use, of course, of Copernicus data from a multidisciplinary angle. Um, in short, the objectives for the summit uh, these two days are uh, to connect real world problems with learning opportunities, to discuss how to design curricula based on the latest work processes, to contribute to the body of knowledge that I just mentioned for geoinformation and earth observation, to help organizations make use of this body of knowledge to create, for example, job profiles and education curricula, and to provide you an opportunity to attend sessions where EU agencies and programs present the very latest in space technologies and data for you to learn from, for you to benefit from, for you to create jobs and to create new businesses on. So with this panel this morning, we want to look at the impact of the most recent technology developments in Earth observation on education and space data application development. We'll also discuss the importance of Earth observation education on future jobs and opportunities, as I already mentioned, to create new businesses. For this topic, we've collected an exciting panel of specialists in the fields of education and job creation in earth observation and space data. So I'll introduce the panel and ask them a few initial questions, after which I'll hand it over to you, our attendees, uh, to ask the panel uh, the questions that matter most to you. So um, let me start by introducing our five panelists and read your short introduction to their backgrounds. So first of all, we're very honored to have uh, Mr. Tome Anticic, who's the State Secretary of Science and Education in Croatia. Um, Dr. Anticic became uh, State Secretary uh, in 2017. His main tasks are to reform the structural fund system in Croatia concerning science, and to implement new science bylaws that emphasize excellence, project success, mobility, and a much closer interaction between science and the high-tech industry. Before his post at the ministry, Dr. Anticic was the director of the Roger Boscovich Institute, short uh, RBI, the most prestigious and largest research institute in Croatia in basic sciences, employing 850 people. He transformed the RBI into a competitive scientific institute. And as a result, RBI, only 5% of Croatian scientists 
now has 50% of Croatian Horizon 2020 projects. Success indeed. Dr. Antichis was involved in numerous FP7 and Horizon 2020 projects, mostly in the field of particle detector systems. He's the co-creator, uh, the co-author, sorry, of the recently stated and started Horizon 2020 ERA chair project, expanding potential in particle and radiation detectors, sensors, and electronics in Croatia, which is the largest European physics project in Croatia. Furthermore, he's the Croatian delegate to the European Strategic Forum on Research Infrastructures, um, ESFRI, and recently became the Croatian representative to the ESFRI Physical Science and Engineering Working Group. Uh, you will not be surprised that Dr. Antichis is a, an experimental particle physicist uh, who spent most of his career at CERN in Switzerland, uh, receiving his PhD from Johns Hopkins University in 1997, following a master's from Cambridge University and the BSc from the University of London. Uh, an impressive uh, biography indeed. Um, our second guest this morning is uh, Mrs. M um, Maria Vittoria Dinceo, uh, who is a policy officer at uh, DG for Defence Industry and Space, DG DEFI's uh, European Commission. Um, um, Maria Dinceo graduated from the Diplomatic Academy of London in 2011 and has been working in the field of international relations since then. In 2017, she joined the Space Research Unit at the European Commission. She's in charge of topics related to research in the context of Space Horizon 2020, in particular aspects related to education and skills development. What we're talking about today, opportunities in support of the growth of the space ecosystem, access to finance, very important, and of course, access to space. So uh, thank you, um, Mrs. Dintel, for joining us this morning. Our third guest is um, uh, a slightly later addition to the lineup, um, but thank you, Professor Vlado Kushan, for joining us on uh, such a short notice. Uh, Professor Kushan has had a fruitful career at the University of Zagreb Faculty of Forestry, where he introduced earth observation into the curricula for forest, forestry engineers. Professor Kushan became one of the key persons in the Oikon company which is fully devoted to the use of earth observation data for environmental and nature protection, governance, and other applications. Um, so thank you again, Professor Kushan, for your flexibility to join us at such short notice. Our fourth guest is um, Jeff Sawyer. Uh, Jeff has been the uh, Secretary General of uh, ERSC. Um, ERSC is the uh, European Association of Remote Sensing Companies um, since 2011. Um, he's driven the development of the association into the widely known and well-regarded organization it is today representing the uh, earth observation industry in Europe. Uh, during his long and varied career, Jeff has, Jeff has held uh, senior management positions in the space industry with Astrium, EDS and Airbus, as well as numerous representative positions in the UK and Europe. In his early career, Jeff was the radar systems designer for ERS-1 and Envisat and later became Vice President for Space Strategy for EDS, which is now known as Airbus Space. Previously, he was a director of ERSC for 12 years, during which he was the chairman for six years from 1991 to 1997. Jeff spent three years working for the European Commission, where he was responsible for supporting space policy, and in particular, the creation of the GMES, which is now the Copernicus program. Jeff is very well known to many in the space and earth observation sectors, and brings this deep wealth of experience and knowledge to support the ambitions of the geoinformation industry that ERSC ultimately represents. Um, so thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Our final guest this morning is uh, Mr. Danny van den Broeke, uh, a research manager at the KU Leuven in Belgium. His field of expertise relates to geospatial data and technologies with particular emphasis on spatial data infrastructures, such as Inspire and, of course, Copernicus. Danny is uh, one of the initiators of the EFA Geo project and serve as scientific and technical coordinator. Since 2011, he's been working on the preparation and development of an ontology-based body of knowledge for the geospatial field, first in the GI Need to Know LLP project and now with Geo. And we mentioned this body of knowledge as a very important element of this, uh, of this summit. So thank you, Mr. Van den Broeke, for joining us uh, in this panel this morning. So um, I think I've said enough about our uh, very impressive panel here. Uh, it's now time for them to uh, further introduce themselves and uh, introduce the topic of our, um, of our session this morning. So uh, let me start the interactive part of this session by, by asking the first question. And I would like to ask uh, all our panelists to, uh, 
to answer this question in uh, in the order that I just uh, read out. Um, um, so basically, we're looking at uh, providing a quick SWOT analysis, uh, which is very common in, in market analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the US observation market. And uh, let me start by uh, asking Mr. Antichit to uh, to answer the first question, and then all the other panelists in, uh, in, in the order given. So uh, Mr. Antichit, um, in your opinion, what are the biggest opportunities and threats in the European Earth observation and geo information sectors, and how will this sector influence educational systems, the labor market, and the creation of future jobs. Uh, well, thank you very much for the questions and the greetings from Zagreb. Unfortunately, it's um, not, uh, it's only online, but I guess um, online is the, new, is the new normal. So in fact, one of the benefits of the creation presidency is in fact to make online meetings a lot more uh, popular and mainstream. So this is our great contribution to the EU, yes. So. We use the coronavirus uh, crisis for that. Uh, but this brings, I mean, to the great uh, um, opportunities. I mean, the, the amount, I mean, as has been emphasized today, the amount of data and um, coming uh, from, you know, things like uh, Copernicus Sentinel data is huge and, and it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, and in fact, this is one area where the EU is in fact leading in the world. The, the data, the useful data is, you know, in order of, terabytes daily. The opportunities are huge. And well, as we know, I mean, data today is really, really everything. And analysis of data is really everything. And basically, if you take a look at, at all the great companies today, they're based on data and data only. And uh, this is something which is in fact seriously underutilized in the EU for various reasons. I don't know, um, different um, you know, smaller uh, systems in different countries, uh, people not used to sort of uh, think in a sense big, but this, I mean, can change and in fact should change and, and all the opportunities are in fact that there. The data is here, it's free to use and it's easy to access. And, uh, and in fact, uh, meetings like this should um, encourage people to dive into it and um, create great new multi, multi-billion or trillion dollar companies worth, I mean, it can be done, and I'm sure some enterprising young persons will find a way to monetize this in the proper way. Um, for this, actually, I mean, one needs more education at all levels, including, in fact, in high schools, in high schools and such. So I think some of the education will change a bit in high schools and, in, uh, and particularly universities to uh, emphasize more the true potential of this. And of course, I mean, a threat is always also to uh, one has to keep up with uh, ever more uh, uh, more uh, modern data, new data, and new satellites. So we're looking forward to that too. That's yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think if uh, yeah. Just in Yes. Uh, hi. Good morning, everybody. And uh, Ramko, thank you for for giving me the opportunity to participate at the uh, Earth Observation Summit. So, to understand, to um, to answer your question on the the perspective of uh, European Earth Observation sector and how it will influence the educational system and uh, labor market. I would like just to quickly maybe start analyzing this from the importance that uh, Copernicus data have, uh, have been used, the contribution of Copernicus data in the managing of uh, the COVID crisis and precisely the, uh, the use of the Copernicus data for the monitor of, uh, monitoring of uh, traffic congestion which allowed policymakers to take informed decisions. So from here, we already start understanding what is the importance of raising awareness on the available tools and data and services coming from our uh, uh, Earth observation programs. Now, the awareness, uh, precisely as Mr. Tomacic uh, underlined, starts from school from schools in, and education, not from elementary school through to um, higher education. Now, and from a European Union institutional perspective, now what I will try to do is I will try to give you a, 
a brief overview on what is uh, what are the communication to keep an eye on and precisely for education as far as edu education is concerned we have two uh, communication uh, uh, that are expected to be adopted by the uh, commission one is uh, the uh, communication on the european education area and the other one is the digital education action plan so uh, both communication are expected for Q3 of 2020. Then from education, the opportunities coming from uh, the uh, earth observation sectors continue with labor and skills. And that's why uh, an other, another uh, co uh, communication that is expected is the updated skills uh, agenda for Europe which is closely connected to the recently adopted uh, communication on a new industrial strategy for Europe. And what uh, the uh, industrial uh, strategy for Europe communication reminded us is precisely what the Croatian Minister for Science Education underlined this morning, that uh, an important investment in people will be required if Europe wants to lead the future twin transition for uh, uh, on uh, uh, environment and digital. Um, now, why is the uh, updated skills agenda, uh, the new communication important? For sure, because it's a continu continuation of the previous one of the 2016, which also allowed for uh, uh, the uh, EO4G project to be uh, funded. So we expect uh, a continuation on that and how to bring the alliance further. Now, to complete the picture again from an institutional perspective, once we have identified the necessary action to be taken on education and uh, uh, labor, it is important to further develop uh, and spread this knowledge, the knowledge and expertise created. And to do this, the upcoming communication on the future of research and innovation and the European uh, research area will be uh, instrumental uh, to create the right uh, uh, working environment for researchers uh, to further uptake the knowledge and facilitate the brain circulation and the creation of knowledge across the ecosystem and to cross fertilize uh, the knowledge created from space data into other sectors. So, well, I think I have uh, can conclude here. Back to you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Itzeo. Uh, um, now I would like to hand over to uh, to, to Professor Kushan uh, of the Faculty of Forestry and in, uh, of the University of Zagreb and Oikon. What is your uh, vision on this? I'm working in private company, OICON. Uh, our most uh, activities are connected with uh, nature protection, environment, and resource management. Uh, it is about 90% of our job, uh, in our work. Uh, and as you can see in this, uh, all three uh, topics, the space and spatial data are of big importance. Now we in the company have uh, 16 different professions working because it is a very uh, var a big variety of uh, specialists that are needed to work within nature protection and environmental protection. And uh, the main and the uh, unique uh, thing that uh, when we are looking for the new employees are that they knew GIS as a basic tool in our job. And also uh, half of our employees are working with uh, space data satellite and aerial images and this is the main topic and main uh, skill that our company uh, give the some importance or some uh, 
concurrence uh, among other companies. As a professor, I was working at Faculty of Forestry and still I'm engaged in the uh, lecturers of remote sensing and GIS in the Faculty of Agriculture in Zagreb, University of Zagreb. And since very beginning, I was started as a assistant of remote of uh, photogrammetry and photo interpretation in uh, forestry. In 90s, we introduced in uh, our lecturers GIS and satellite images because we recognized then that there are, there are importance in uh, forestry and all other uh, specialists and professions that need uh, spatial data. Uh, those development was very uh, slow in the beginning because of the uh, cost of the satellite images. In that time, the one uh, Landsat image cost about ten thousand dollars. And uh, when the Copernicus started, the most of the uh, activities regarding remote sensing starting to grow exponential. It is the very big influence. And nowadays there are a lot of professions, a lot of things, a lot of uh, people that are using remote sensing. Uh, some troubles in using remote sensing here in Croatia is still uh, old fashioned th uh, thoughts because some of the professions and in some cases, administration don't trust in remote sensing and earth observation data. And uh, working within the GLOBE project, where I worked with uh, students primary uh, uh, in primary and secondary schools, and where I uh, had, had workshops with them about remote sensing and land cover data, I realize that young people are very aware of this observation data and like to do with this data. So I think that uh, parallel with the teaching young people and students uh, and uh, at the university to use uh, earth observation, uh, we think, I think that we should give some efforts to give the knowledge to the investors and administration that third observation can be very uh, useful and can be uh, very uh, efficient in obtaining the data as Professor Anticic says, the terabytes and terabytes of data. I think it's my opinion. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Koshan. Um, so I would like to, uh, to hand it over to, uh, to Jeff Sawyer. So Jeff, what do you see as the main opportunities and threats in the earth observation and geoinformation sectors? Yes, thank you very much, Remco, and thank you for the organisers for inviting me to, to to speak here. It really is a pleasure. It would have been even bigger pleasure to, of course, to have been in Zagreb, but uh, unfortunately, that's not possible the, these days. Um, ERSC is is very pleased to be part of uh, EO for Geo. Uh, access to skills is a fundamental for industry, and our role in this um, sector is to represent the industry and to try to uh, to help them them grow. Indeed. We are a trade association, we're based in Brussels, but our main goal is not about lobbying, although that's part of our work. It is about trying to help the sector grow and to create new opportunities for the sector to take. So um, I'm going to start with the threats because um, clearly the, um, the current crisis, the COVID crisis, we've, we've been in contact with our members, we've talked with them about how it's impacting them. And most of them, 70%, are already seeing or anticipating uh, impacts on them from the, the crisis, largely through 
um, revenues coming from commercial companies, from private, from um, public sector in the uh, in the longer term as well. So there's immediate threat from the uh, from the, the the crisis that we need to uh, to recognise. But I think that also brings opportunities. But in terms of other threats, clearly, I think other people have mentioned competition internationally is very fierce. So the companies are, are trying to work and very successfully working in a global market, but the global competition is very intense. And um, the other threat I see at the moment, also partially linked to COVID, is access to finance and the uh, the cost of finance that is likely to go up in the uh, in the near future, and um, which will act as a break on on companies to develop. Um, because now let me turn to the opportunities because. The sector is developing. We do uh, a survey of the industry that we're now being asked to do every year rather than every two years as we've done in the past. But we see a sustained growth in the sector of 10%, which is, is not a shabby growth. And that's been sustained now over uh, eight, eight, nine years. So it's a, it's a sector which is, is growing. We also see it in the work we do on looking at the value of Earth observation. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, um, reports we publish under the umbrella of said Sentinel Benefit Study, where we look at the use of a particular product. And we take one product and we say, how is it being used? And in most of those cases, we see that there is partial use of the product, but there is so much more potential for its use. So I'm, I'm very optimistic for the future of the sector once we can get through this short-term issue. I said that COVID can also bring uh, opportunities. Um, Schumpeter in the um, 1930s looked at creative destruction. And that's what we're going to see over the next few years. We're going to see industries, other industries really under stress, big changes in the, uh, in the way we do business. So that is going to create opportunities. And I think this sector has um, a, a big uh, place to play Maria, you talked about the COVID uh, monitoring and the impact of uh, Earth observation. The need for global intelligence has never been greater. And also, global tensions mean that the need for non-invasive intelligence has not never been greater. And we heard this uh, directly from the World Bank uh, last week in our, uh, our most recent EO Cafe, who were talking about monitoring their projects, which they cannot now do on the ground, so they need satellite data to do it. Digital awareness, we're all becoming more uh, digital aware. And I see other sectors, the med medical sector, which is rapidly, rapidly adopting um, remote telemedicine as a, as a tool in this. And so digital awareness is also going to help the, uh, the sector. And finally, the, uh, the awareness of the impact of the climate, which maybe is uh, climate change, which is maybe driving part of this crisis and the Green Deal. So there are lots of opportunities, some short-term threats, some more serious long-term threats from international competition, uh, but I'm very optimistic about the, the sector. Um, just very quickly on skills, because we're asked to talk about that. Um, as part of our survey, we also ask about the ability of companies to fill the posts. 80% report some difficulty in filling the posts with the uh, skills, with the right skills. And the, uh, the thing that most of them are looking for is programming and uh, software development skills. We also hear marketing skills, but the technical skills seem to be at the, uh, the forefront of the, of the need. So that's just uh, a very quick perspective on the threats and opportunities on the sector and the sector itself. I'm happy to develop that theme further if there's time, but I hand back to you, Remco, for the, the Danny. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, as you said, I would like to hand it over to, uh, to Mr. Van den Broeke with the same question. Okay, thank you, Remco. Uh, I hope you hear me fine. Um, um, uh, it has been already said by several of the speakers that, of course, we the opportunity is there. We have an enormous amount of, of geospatial data and space data. Uh, I should mention, however, that it's not only Copernicus, because the thing that really changed is that besides the Copernicus infrastructure, which is very rich, uh, nowadays we can link it to a lot of other information. Uh, there are other infrastructures out there, uh, geospatial infrastructures like Inspire, but also statistical data, 
a lot of sensory data. So people are nowadays real sensors and delivering uh, streams of information. And the strength and the change that really emerge is that we can link all these different pieces uh, together and getting new insights. But it means also that we need to use new technologies, new methods to process these data, to get new insights, because you can have huge volumes, but if you don't process it and make useful information out of it, uh, you can't directly use it for decision making. And that's what we need. Um, regarding education and skills, then there is a big challenge, of course, because we should admit it's not a real threat, but rather maybe a weakness or, or a challenge is that, of course, our higher education systems usually are changing relatively slowly. Programs are modified, yes. Over time, they are improving. Uh, they are integrating the new developments, but that is not going overnight. So I think there is a real challenge to be able to cope with that. And for that reason also, I think that, for example, higher education institutes should also focus more on collaboration with industry. We'll come back to that in the next topic of the discussion, uh, where we also focus on lifelong learning, vocational training, in addition to the academic training. And that can be adapted more in, in a more dynamic way, more easily, can host also new developments. And that's really required, I think. And so I would say there are three keywords for me from that perspective. There is one, the modernization of the educational system at large to host all these new developments and opportunities. Uh, the upskilling, systematic and permanent upskilling of people. And then, of course, it's impossible to cover all the aspects of the space and geospatial field. The, before you were uh, uh, an expert, you had an occupational profile very well delineated, but now the field is so broad already that it's impossible even for university or bigger companies to cover all the aspects. So you need also specialization and again, if you speak about specialization, you speak also about uh, different uh, type of uh, disciplines that you bring together to work together to solve problems. It's not one type of profile that you need, but you, you need a multi multiple type of profiles and working together uh, to solve problems and also to do education is the key, I think, in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van den Broeke. Um, I, I, I wrote with you while, uh, while you uh, well, you gave your answers and I'm, I'm, I, I have quite a list of threats, barriers to, uh, to, to the industry, but I have a much longer list of opportunities. And I guess that's really what we want to, uh, to focus on right now. How can, we, how can we mitigate these threats? How can we work around these threats uh, and barriers to entry? And how can we benefit from these opportunities? Uh, before I move on to the next question, I would like to uh, remind all attendees um, to please ask your questions in the chat of the live stream. So uh, use the, the chat functionality in the live stream and we will pick up your questions from there to ask in the second half of this, uh, of this panel discussion. Um, but before we do that, um, I would like to ask a second question to, uh, to all our panelists here and, and, and please answer them in the same sequence because we talked about opportunities and threats, um, which, which is really uh, important to understand uh, the, 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 the scope of the, uh, of the Earth observation geoinformation markets. But I would also like to look at uh, some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses of the industry. So where is the European um, um, Earth observation sector particularly strong? Uh, and where are the weaknesses in, in comparison to, uh, to, to maybe uh, the sector globally? So um, where do you see strengths and weaknesses of the European Earth observation geoinformation ecosystem from a government business education trinity perspective. Um, what should be done to ensure a leading role of European earth observation and geoinformation sector globally? And I would like to, uh, to start again with uh, with the State Secretary of Science and Education in Croatia, Dr. Ante Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, interesting question. Um, so in, in general, businesses are very agile, and uh, but for them to really sort of flower to for its full potential to realize them, one needs both um, a good sort of a governance and a good education system. However, both in the sense that governance and education tend to be very uh, slow moving entities. And uh, this is a special problem, for example, at an EU wide level where you have basically 28 separate, not really fully coordinated um, 
uh, uh, slow moving entities, which which actually prevents you know, the businesses from uh, scaling up, which is actually a, a, a big threat. And uh, then, company, then com the businesses from outside the EU, in the sense, have an easier uh, path to growth. So uh, in a sense, the, the laws and the, and the way the data is used by the government should be, uh, well, one, uh, more unified, but also should be more modernized. I mean, uh, a lot of the laws and reference, they use data the way it was collected basically um, in the 19th or 20th century and not really the 21st century. So if this gets harmonized and modernized, then the businesses can, uh, can uh, actually also uh, flourish much easier. Education, of course, has to be modified. I mean, it's the the modern world is changing extremely fast, and uh, uh, a lot more has to be, um, as has been mentioned also on the previous and previous questions, also in university and high school level and such. And uh, um, for the children, I mean, the 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 children are very well aware of the modern technologies, but the, but the, in a sense, the education system and the teachers usually are not. So in a sense, I think we should ask the children what should be changed, uh, because things are moving, again, in the education system, in many ways, they have uh, moved in the 20th or 19th century. Things have to change there. Uh, a lot more data-driven analysis, uh, education has to be introduced at all levels. And then the government's business education triangle will be closed. But uh, it starts with a much more uh, flexible and much more modern governing system, which is not easy to change, especially in the EU with uh, the, this uh, discordant this tones across different countries. But in fact, it, it is necessary. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anticic. So uh, I'd like to hand it over to uh, our policy officer at the DG for Defense Industry and Space, uh, Mrs. Vintel. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ramco. Uh, so the strength and weaknesses, okay. Uh, right, so uh, in my opinion, the strengths coming from the Earth observation and uh, uh, geospatial information ecosystem come, of course, from the vast array of services that uh, uh, space data, so for Copernicus and uh, geospatial data, are able to offer in the different sectors of society. So from climate monitoring, land, marine, atmosphere monitoring, emergency uh, services, security, and surveillance. So there, there is a lot of uh, uh, of strengths there. At the same time, uh, weaknesses, or uh, as I uh, would like to maybe uh, redefine it, areas where we um, there is room for improvement, uh, is that if we do not have a population that is informed enough of all the benefits coming from uh, space data, we will risk of uh, losing our competitive uh, advantage. So to answer the second part uh, of, uh, of your question, what, are, uh, what should be done, to, uh, what measures should be taken to overcome this? I think uh, it is important to, um, to have a, a sector strategy and to identify a frame of action with the strategic objectives of what we want to do, where we, what, what we want to achieve in the next five, 10 uh, years or so. And uh, these uh, actions should definitely uh, look at uh, um, the uh, actors of the uh, Earth observation and geospatial ecosystem. So from uh, uh, academia, so universities, research organization, uh, business industries, SMEs, startups, but also the facilitating actors, like uh, as Jeff uh, mentioned uh, during his intervention, access to finance is a very important uh, element. And also the uh, local authorities, so the relation with the 
with the with the local governments, cities, uh, uh, regions, uh, member states, and so on. So by doing so, we will. Uh, so in my in my view, if you want, it, it's important to act locally. Uh, and uh, facilitate the creation of uh, ad hoc structures that address several aspects that are needed for the sector to further flourish. And you should look at the uh, three mission, uh, if you want, of uh, working on education and uh, how to best design curricula in academia also with the help of uh, of, uh, of businesses because of course uh, to, to prepare the future workforce then to work on the on the skills that are needed for both sectors and also i think we should also uh, not uh, forget the citizen engagement element because it is important once again to have a population that is aware of all the benefits coming from uh, our uh, Earth observation data. So with this in mind, if we are able to have uh, a connected and interconnected ecosystem across Europe, I think we will also be able to, uh, to have more uh, market uptake, more opportunities for business creation, uh, facilitating intersector mobility uh, across the, all axes of the ecosystem. Uh, and uh, yes, voila, that's all. I will uh, back okay. to Okay, okay, thank you, Mrs. Tinsel. Um, very interesting to hear uh, a long list of uh, areas for improvement. So although we have this great system in place, uh, we are nowhere near at the end of it uh, to create all these opportunities. So. Uh, um, Professor Kushan, I would like to, to hear your opinion because you're involved both on the academic side of things as on the application side of things. So can you give us your insight, please? Yes, uh, the main uh, strength and the main uh, opportunity is the variety of products uh, that we can use now. It is a huge amount of images, uh, softwares, applications, that can be used for uh, earth observation and it is a very big opportunity and it is very good. On the other side, the witness, as I saw it, is a little bit interconnection with uh, practice and practical work and education. In a lot of cases, I saw that the teachers educate students to learn the software, to learn how to use uh, Earth observation data. And also they, their investigation is something uh, and research work uh, of those teachers and uh, researchers are something that are dealing with the improvement of technology and obtaining data. Uh, in my opinion, and in my uh, experience, uh, more practical work on real data or real uh, situation should be performed during the education. Then the students and the professionals will realize what can be done and can be used their knowledge uh, almost immediately after the finish the education. Now there is a little bit discrepancies between those two uh, things because some of the uh, professionals are very skilled in the uh, software but they don't know what to do with it. And it is uh, something that should be improved in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next, same question to, uh, to Mr. Jeff Sawyer of, uh, of ERSC, please. Thanks, Thanks Remka. Thank you, Remka. 
So um, you asked talk about weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses, and the uh, sort of government business uh, education triangle. Um, weaknesses can also sometimes be opportunities because if we can close the weakness, then we have an opportunity. Uh, we have 120 uh, uh, members, over 120 members from right across Europe. Um, our survey that we conduct uh, says that we there are over 600 companies right across Europe. Uh, there are several in Croatia, but we have no members from Croatia yet, so that would be an interesting uh, gap to, to, to fill. But that, for me, is, is both a strength and a weakness. Um, the weakness is the fragmentation. You know, we have interests right across Europe, and so the opportunity is to try and overcome those. And that brings me to my strength, which is our ability to cooperate and to form partnerships. I'll just mention one other weakness, which um, uh, hasn't, I don't think, been mentioned yet, but is the, the lack of the large digital players in, in Europe. And uh, as this potentially becomes a channel to market, so there is a, a risk and a danger to the uh, European companies to lose control over their own uh, business channels, their business models. But that's not really something I wanted to develop um, in this, this talk. I want to talk much more about business and government and, and academia. So in strengths, I think we are good at partnerships, we're good at cooperation, uh, largely uh, sponsored and fostered by European programs. I think we have a very strong technical capability, a very strong industry. And um, of course, we have the ability to uh, promote uh, private data and Copernicus. Um, I should also say that in Europe, we have strong research capabilities. How to make these come together? Um, our, our companies and us as a sector representative, we're sort of having balancing two relationships in this triangle. So the, acad the academic relationship and the government relationship. With academia, um, we would like to see more business-driven R&D. I mean, it, it's frustrating that so many of the Horizon 2020 projects turn out not to have a sustainable future. And so we'd like to try to um, improve and increase um, the sustainability and the longer-term return from the R&D investment. Of course, my view on that is a little bit partisan because I'd like to see industry put more into the, uh, into the lead. But I think a closer relationship between uh, in academia and industry can, can strongly help. And the Sector Skills Alliance is certainly a one tool to, uh, to help with that. Um, with government, 65% uh, of the uh, sector's revenues, so the industry revenues, come from the public sector. So it's over half, 65%. But if you look into that, you find that 50 to 55% of that is because the government is a customer for the services that are being generated. Whether it's surveillance services, whether it's environmental services, government is a customer. And 10% of those revenues are government sponsoring industry and trying to provide some industry support. Um, government as a customer is, is, is very, very healthy, but it also makes for a strong complexity in our sector. Uh, space is already complex. Earth observation for me is the most complex of the uh, space sectors because of the interest um, of public uh, institutions and, and industry. But I was asked recently if, um, if uh, government can do more to help innovation in industry. And I was surprised at other answers that were saying no. Um, my view is yes, um, the public sector can do a lot to help in innovation. Um, public sector programs are built largely on public sector goods. So the Copernicus program is built to serve the needs of the public sector. But with a, a small amount of alignment with industry, a small amount of additional investment, that program can also serve to drive the economy and jobs. So the, the um, public sector can uh, help stimulate industry and create the environment where industry can provide more innovation in partnership with academia. So there is a very strong triangular relationship here that uh, I would like to see uh, developed further. Um, there, are, there are more points that I'd like to, uh, to make there, but I'll perhaps leave those for later for the, for the discussion and um, hand over to uh, Remco and, and Danny. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. So yes, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Danny of uh, Geo to uh, talk about strengths and weaknesses as well. Um, yeah, if you look at the strengths and weaknesses of, in fact, the collaboration in, within the Geo system, I rather prefer also to start uh, with the strengths uh, first, because I, I think we see over the past five to 10 years, an intensified collaboration already uh, in the sector uh, between academia, public sector bodies, private sector, associations, not-for-profit organizations, etc. Uh, I just refer, of course, to EO4GEO itself, which is a good example. It's an alliance, a sector skills alliance, which is not academia driven. Of course, academia is in there, but we have uh, ERSC in there, we have uh, several SMEs, we have several uh, public sector bodies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there is already collaboration because the answer on which skills we need and the development of examples in different subsectors can be done, as I said before, by one entity, even if it's a big university or by one big company, we need to collaborate. And I think that's happening more and more. I just want to refer also to some other Erasmus Plus projects like GI cases, where also collaboration between the geospatial sector and uh, the academia sector and the private sector was the key, the, the central uh, topic of, of, the, of the project. There is a new project ongoing called GeoBIS, also Erasmus+, Plus, focusing more on the uh, Western Balkan and Moldova, where also academia want to modernize their curricula uh, in the geospatial and in geoinformatics sector, uh, also by the collaboration between academia and the private sector. So I think we can already see that's happening and it's happening more and more because there is a, a push factor from industry, from public sector to deliver students that are really ready for the market to be integrated in their organization that are able to solve problems. And then I come to my second point. I think one of the mechanisms that can help to overcome the barriers and uh, help to streamline and, and shape the collaboration is to work what we call in, in EOFG, we call it case-based learning or project-based learning or problem solving. Uh, all these concepts are interrelated and there you need collaboration to have real cases and that can take different forms. It can take the form of a project work with students involved, can be an internship, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different forms to do it. But the idea is to collaborate on real practical cases, as has been said by other speakers before. Uh, instead of starting only from the data and the software, you start from a, a problem or a case that you want to solve. And from there, you develop the curricula. And that's also what we try to do in neo for geo of course, there are still weaknesses. The uh, collaboration could be improved. For example, in eo we were very surprised when we did our first task was to collect what is the supply on education and training in the geospatial and the space field. And that was amazing. It's strength at the same time. There is a lot out there, but it's true that there are a lot of initiatives that could be improved by even more uh, interlinkages and better collaboration as well. But I think the strengths are uh, more important than uh, the drawbacks, I think. That's it. Thank you. Hand over to Remco. Okay. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, so uh, thank you very much for, for answering these two questions about uh, the opportunities and threats, the, the strengths and weaknesses, uh, indicating where Europe is a very strong position uh, and where there's areas uh, to improve things. Um, for, for the second half of the um, of, of the um, session, um, as I said, uh, I would like to hand it over to uh, to the public. And we have we've received quite a few uh, questions already. And uh, as we have lots of students and and young professionals and young people in this uh, in, in in this two day conference, uh, one of the questions that is uh, is jumping out is um, about how. Um, um, students and, and young people can prepare themselves for a career in the space industry. So uh, I would like to, to start uh, by asking this question to Jeff. Um, it's a question from uh, Zvonimir uh, Nevestic um, to Jeff and also to, uh, uh, to Professor Kushan. Is, can you be more precise in indicating the skills and knowledge that uh, the business will require from new professionals entering the market? Jeff, can you start? 
Yeah, sure. Um, as I said, from um, from our survey, most of the companies are, are looking for uh, for computer and uh, and programming skills. But um, I know that uh, market knowledge is also also very important. So I, I think Wadio for Geo is, uh, is is doing to try to help uh, build curricula which are um, are sort of business focus of students which have an awareness of business as well as the technical skills is uh, is is really great there are a number of uh, tools being uh, developed which can also help students find their um, their, their place and uh, you know, we're happy to help to try to uh, to bridge uh, between um, uh, students and uh, and the industry to uh, try to help uh, find either short-term placements or long-term jobs I, I can sort of also offer that I mentioned earlier the uh, revenue, the sector revenue is growing at 10%. The level of employment is growing even faster than that. So there is a very strong employment growth at the moment. We have to see how that's going to be impacted over the next 12 months. That's that's for certain. But uh, the, the opportunities for students in the sector, I believe, are, are very, very good. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. And, and and having said that, I can I can recommend everybody listening to uh, to go to the Earth website and 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 find a wealth of information um, about all the things that you mentioned, including the reports on the industry um, uh, list of membership to see where the Earth observation sector in Europe is, and uh, a lot of information very relevant to uh, to students who are interested in working in this sector. Um, I would like to ask the same question to. Uh, to Professor Kushan, uh, from a, from a Croatian point of view, where do you see uh, the, the the key skills and knowledge that is needed um, by students to be successful in this sector? Uh, as I told, we are seeking for the students that are uh, skilled in the Earth observation and GIS, and we are going to employ some new. Uh, employee, we make a test. And the questions of the, in this test is uh, that uh, on that kind that can be uh, answered without using GIS and the observation, or that can be uh, settled by Earth observation and GIS. And always the advantage is that the employee solve our test with using GIS and remote sensing. And you know, uh, during the edu uh, high education, there are always students uh, that are good and they seek to something new and something different, something that is not uh, already uh, in a curriculum. And uh, there is uh, more and more students that are learning uh, parallel with the, uh, their education, remote, uh, remote sensing uh, techniques and GIS techniques, and they are trying to solve some problems within their uh, study, and uh, we can recognize them very well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Sorry, I had some trouble unmuting myself there. Um, the next question um, I would like to ask uh, to Dr. Ante Cic and to Mr. Van den Broeke. Um, and it's about, uh, when well, you spoke about formal education, but what about uh, vocational education training and informal education? Dr. Ante Cic? Yes, yes, uh, in fact, uh, in general, the trend, in fact, which is in fact being exasperated by this uh, um, coronavirus crisis, is uh, um, is to focus a lot more informal education and uh, re remote uh, um, education. I mean, the, about ten years ago, those uh, moots courses were. Uh, very much popular, but then they have sort of uh, kind of died down. So I, I think, in fact, that this uh, crisis will, in fact, um, create uh, is in fact creating a new uh, new teaching models as such for uh, um, 
lifelong learning education for, for all kinds of, I mean, for, for uh, uh, people who are actually out of university and such. So this, in fact, is, is going to give a lot of opportunity for uh, people who are not in this field to actually join in and such. And uh, going a, a bit more formally, I mean, vocational schools should adjust too. And that, I mean, in Croatia, we are trying to do that too for a curricular reform, also for vocational schools. And uh, hopefully this will continue. It has to be something which is being continuous to work on. And there's a great, great opportunity there too. And as uh, Professor Kuchin has said that uh, a lot more hands-on learning is necessary. And this is uh, with practical skills. So this is something we are very much uh, working on. And this is one of the great opportunities in fact of today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Van der Broeke, do you have something uh, to say about uh, the role of informal and vocational education versus traditional? Uh, yes, I, I would uh, tend to agree that besides the formal education, uh, other types of education and training uh, gain importance. Uh, and universities can contribute to that, but it should be said that also private companies, for example, members of ERSC are also providing education and training in their, their portfolio. That's perfectly fine. Uh, so ideally we should also collaborate on this, on this topic and that's really possible if we tackle indeed, uh, if we have joint projects and from there we have also an offer of education and training, whether that's alone the university or in collaboration with the, the private sector, that's perfectly possible. And that's already happening. And, and indeed, the technologies allow nowadays to have more informal trainings. The MOOCs have been mentioned, uh, but uh, you can have other forms as well. And when we analyzed with EO4GEO the offer, the supply of uh, training and education in the sector, then uh, it was different types, really, uh, besides academic traditional training. Uh, there were many other initiatives at different levels, different flavors, uh, different approaches, different technologies used to provide the training. And I think that's the way to go, uh, to have this diverse platform and palette of uh, offers. I hand it over back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I actually have a follow-up question um, for you. Um, and, and, and this is about something that, that several of you indicated as, uh, as, as one of the weaknesses um, and, and one of the threats, and that is the slow um, adaption of education to a rapidly changing Earth observation field. So how would you address, um, uh, Mr. van den Broeke, uh, this problem of slow change of, of higher education programs? Yeah, the the slow pace of change has at a, especially at higher education institutes is mainly because when you want to make bigger modifications, for example, a new program or a total new course, that takes time. That's not done overnight because you need to uh, well, you need to follow a whole procedure, uh, and it has to be accepted by the university, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that takes by definition time. Um, uh, but of course, what you can do already in uh, higher education uh, and training is to integrate new elements of the developments that you see happening. Uh, that's usually possible. And I think we'll, the, the different departments and different faculties should be more open to host new elements of new developments uh, step by step without doing a complete revolution. Uh, and I think that's possible, and that's also acceptable by uh, by the university. That's that's one one method to do it. The other way to solve the problem is to have more what we say what we said before to have more other type of informal trainings and training offers. More and more universities offer also vocational training programs. Uh, they can decide that themselves. Of course, if you fully follow the vet. Uh, system, then it takes also more time, etc. But you can also have other initiatives, uh, and there is a demand for that. There is a demand from public sector, also from private sector, also to do that together. So there, there is also an opportunity. And just to give one example of our own university, uh, in past uh, uh, projects, we developed interesting new insights, uh, applied research projects, and results from these projects can be then uh, translated in new training materials. 
And that new training material can then be hosted at least partially by, for example, uh, professors and teachers at university. Uh, not in full, but at least you can take that into account. So there is also a kind of mechanisms to go from innovation, innovative uh, research and applied research projects uh, into the educational system. And that would make the system more dynamic uh, and more, well, changing over time without maybe even noticing. That's something different than the big change with a new program or a totally new course, for example. Okay, thank you very much. I would actually like to pass the same question to, uh, to Dr. Antecic about addressing the problem of the slow change of higher education. What can the government do to, to improve this, uh, I guess in higher education, but in, in education in general? Talking here about two entities, which uh, by definition, well, depends somewhere more, somewhere less, are slow moving. And they are too slow moving for today's world. I mean, both the government and unfortunately, the, I mean, from which they can expect to be slow moving, but also the academia, which tends to be a bit too traditional in these days. So uh, it is not easy. And it's something we've been grappling for in Croatia here and trying to introduce new laws, which in fact emphasize as, as you know, excellent flexibility and such, but it's not easy. One way could be in fact, you know, to link um, financing of universities to how much um, non-traditional, you know, education they perform, you know, and to how, how closely integrated it is to, with businesses, especially with this uh, new high-tech modern businesses, data analysis, and, and in fact, uh, link success there and the amount of there to the to the amount of financing financing they get on a yearly basis i mean so uh money is a very powerful motivator and uh, even to the academia and uh if they say there's actually a, a clear financial reward to be flexible in your education system and such then this uh, then this then the higher education will be more flexible of course, the academia in general does not like this kind of financing, and, and even if it's on a, a very small amount, but it's something which I think should be pushed for, and this is something we are in fact also pushing for in Croatia. But it's, um, it's, it's not easy to do, but it's actually long-term, it is very necessary. Okay, thank you very much. Um, again, looking at the number of students that we have in this, in this session, I have a, a very interesting question um, from someone called Stephanie to, um, to Maria. Um, and, and this is about the, uh, the global competitiveness. So, uh, the, uh, her question is, how will uh, the European Union ensure a fair competition in the Earth observation field uh, with new private government initiatives like SpaceX by Elon Musk? Are, are the future jobs assured in Europe? Wow, that is a very, very interesting question. Um, I mean, how, how will we ensure fair competition? I mean, uh, as uh, I think it was Jeff who mentioned it uh, earlier on in his uh, uh, introduction, um, of course, international competition is fierce. And uh, we, we need uh, to, to be able to, uh, on, on the one hand, uh, be able to uh, facilitate business creation across Europe and uh, at the same time protect our strategic assets. And I think that uh, the, um, what we have seen from the recovery package that uh, has been uh, recently presented by our uh, president, uh, I mean, we're going exactly towards that direction, towards, uh, um, uh, you know, sustaining even more uh, the, the strategic infrastructure and the strategic assets of, of uh, throughout Europe. And this also includes space, um, space assets, our space program, space infrastructure, both in, uh, in, uh, in space and in land. So how do we uh, now ensure fair competition? Uh, well, by... Uh, that this is a, a, a challenging, a challenging question, but uh, I think that by studying our counterparts uh, internationally and trying to um, first of all promote our uh, our work ethics, 
uh, as uh, w one of the big chapters of uh, of this new commission, the von der Leyen Commission is protect, uh, uh, promoting our uh, EU way of uh, way of life, and this also, in my opinion, how I read it, it also goes for the for the competition. So we should promote more our value and the value that we we're striving to promote also for uh, competitiveness and. Uh, uh, industrial competitiveness. Um, I think this is uh, how we uh, ensure fair competition by leveling the playing field internationally, by engaging with international uh, actors and space faring nation, and to try to see if we can adopt, uh, you know, recognize standards uh, uh, worldwide. But uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, our the other panelists would like to further contribute. Sure, if there's anyone who uh, who has a, who has a, an urgent answer to this, just raise your hands. Jeff, uh, I know you wanted to say something on the previous topic, so uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'll comment on, on both. So, I mean, there's a lot of visibility um, at the moment, of course, with the fantastic uh, uh, expedition to uh, launch the, the SpaceX and the Dragon crew module. Uh, it's been fascinating watching it over the last few years. And I've got the model of the space station behind me, which is a, is a, is a really nice reference. I see Remco has a, an excellent picture as, as, as well. But um, I think Europe has real, real strength in services. You know, we, we, we focus on services, we provide services. Uh, whereas the US is focusing perhaps much more on infrastructure. And uh, so there, I think, is something that we can really exploit um, in, in, in Europe. Um, there is a strong industrial base. Uh, it needs to be nurtured. It needs to work more closely in the triangle, as we said earlier. Um, but I, I really think that industry has uh, some, some great strengths here, um, and we, we hope to, uh, to realize those. Um, just going back to the previous comment about the pace of change in education, I mean, it's ironic in, in many ways. I alluded earlier, I stated earlier, this is a very complex sector. And of course, the pace of change is enormous. It's, it's changing so quickly. And mostly where digital um, infrastructure is changing is in consumer markets, where there's a mass market of, of consumers ready to individually choose to adopt new technologies and to take them on, on board. Um, in our sector, we're mainly dealing with business to government and business to business. And there, it's not so evident um, the, to, to adopt new technologies. There are processes which have been established. There are procedures and ways of working that people are reluctant to abandon in favor of new data sources and new technologies. So yes, we'd like to see it faster, but we need to recognize also that the sector's changing. So I support fully uh, Danny's um, efforts in trying to uh, introduce new processes into the educational curriculum, and that's why we're part of EO for Geo. But we also need to work to educate the customers as well, so that they are familiar or more familiar with what the technology can provide them. And it's not just a question of, of showing them examples of what it can do. It's goes deeper than that because they need to understand the use of geographic information and GIS technology and the absorption of information streams into what they're, they're doing. We've been working with um, a road infrastructure uh, developer recently, and it's so apparent. The, you, you get one person who's enthusiastic, who tries to spread the word, but they face barriers at every step they take in, in the company. So we need to have a wider education not just on the supplier side, but also on the customer side. And thanks, Renko. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, uh, just to note, we're getting uh, we're getting many questions, um, so we, we will probably not be able, although we do still have a bit of time, we will not be able to answer all questions. Uh, but rest assured, we will uh, take note of your question and, uh, and, and pass them to our panelists uh, to answer, perhaps over email. We have your emails, so if you ask a question, uh, we can we can send you the answer uh, by email. I would like to stay with you, Jeff, if, if, if that's okay, um, for a minute, because you represent, of course, the uh, the Earth observation and geoinformation industry in Europe. Um, we get a, a, a few questions again about 
how to find these jobs. So a question from Antonios to, to you and also to Denny. Uh, could you inform us uh, if there are any possibilities to work in Copernicus organizations or the affiliated partners and research institutions? Where can we find the jobs? Um, yes, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Um, and that's something that we can re re reply in, the, in an email. As I said earlier, there are tools which are, are being developed, um, but I, I don't have those references immediately in, in front of me. Um, as far as the industry is concerned, then you know, we can act as, as a bridge. But on the wider side, in the public institutions, um, there I have, uh, I have less to, uh, to offer directly, but can certainly support through email. Um, we see at the moment something like 10,000 jobs across Europe in the industry. There's at least the same in the, in the public side and institutions. So uh, I think there are plenty of opportunities there. And uh, maybe somebody else can point directly at a website or a, a tool to uh, that I can provide an email, but not uh, off the cuff. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Danny, do you have any, any insights as to uh, how people can find the jobs from a near for geo perspective there? Um, yeah, I think in more general terms first, I think there is indeed a, a, a big opportunity and it's it's not only uh, possibilities or opportunities in the private sector, that's for sure, uh, but also in public sector and even in academia. Uh, to give just uh, one example, uh, our department, we are uh, linked to the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, have been growing over the past 10 years enormously. Uh, there are almost 400 scientists now in that department and almost all of them use geospatial technology, remote sensing, etc. Uh, so there is a huge demand because uh, location and space is to be used in many, many uh, sectors. So there are many application domains. So there, there is, a, I think, a vast uh, uh, opportunity for many young, young people to, to find a job. Uh, it's not always maybe on the technologies themselves, even not maybe, but uh, also on the application of the technologies and, and the usage of the data. Um, in EO4G also, of course, uh, we try to promote uh, not jobs per se, for example, but uh, one of the things we develop, and that will be explained in one of the other sessions, is a job offer tool, for example. So we see what we are doing not only as developing knowledge and skills and defining them, defining curricula, but also to offer to the private sector, to the public sector, uh, some tool sets that can be used to, uh, at least for example, to better describe their job offer so that it's more clear uh, for newcomers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we have kind of indirect role to play there, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we're getting lots of questions from uh, from, from students about these things. So uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for these answers. I, I have a more technical question for Maria, if I may. Um, and, and this is about how the European Union is uh, is facilitating uh, the growth uh, of, of, of uh, the uptake of Earth observation data. It's it's uh, coming from Ricardo Prentis. Um, as a remote sensing data user, I'd like to know uh, the virtual infrastructure of Copernicus, is it prepared to offer more virtual machine services? And I guess you can make that more general. Is the European Union continuing to invest in the technological infrastructure to facilitate uh, um, um, Earth observation data usage? Yes. Uh, well, so uh, of course, and I, I think uh, Danny will be uh, able to help me uh, to address this question precisely because uh, he's working on the uh, EO4GEO uh, project and uh, one of the uh, deliverables that have been, uh, that resulted from, uh, from the project is precisely the uh, areas that have been identified as, let's say, a disruptor for uh, Earth observation and precisely uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, 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 virtual reality, uh, blockchain, uh, cybersecurity, and, uh, and so on, are definitely uh, areas uh, where there is, a, of course, a need and uh, for, for us to, to act and uh, uh, these are areas that uh, we are now, if you want, this new com with this new commission, the, the way it has been structured, um, we have been uh, facilitated by the fact that we have a common commissioner that is in charge of both uh, 
um, digital, the digital agenda and uh, space. So uh, in the next, uh, well, we are already uh, exploring it now, with the, but I, I see that in the, in the next, uh, in the next year, we will uh, be have a, a clearer understanding on how to address this, uh, these measures and how to further establish in the link between uh, uh, Copernic Earth observation and geospatial data and the digital world that will be uh, for uh, that uh, the, the, the person who asked the question uh, was referring to. Now, I, I don't have a, a definitive answer today, as of today. But maybe, I don't know if uh, Danny can uh, help me, uh, because uh, he's, uh, he's in charge of, uh, of the EO4GEO. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Maria. Um, so I don't have a direct uh, feedback on what Maria said, but if I understood the question correctly, uh, the question is also about the development of Copernicus offering more uh, services and uh, more specifically virtual machine services. Uh, if I understood well all the whole Copernicus setup, and uh, in fact in EOFGO, Vito is one of the uh, partners who is uh, uh, managing the land monitoring service of Copernicus. Uh, these services are continuously improved and further extended and developed based on the experience of the users. Uh, whether that's private uh, companies that uh, develop a new application uh, or uh, research academia that are using the data and the service for education and training, but also for research, of course. Um, so yes, in that sense, that will happen in, uh, over the past years, besides the Copernicus uh, data and services, the service to give access to the data, you have also more specific, the DIAs who provide uh, also kind of um, tools to, to process the data so that you can do something more with the data directly without being, or without the necessi necessity to really uh, exploit it totally yourself with your own servers, etc. So there are some changes in Copernix to, to offer that, and I'm sure, but that's okay, okay, that's my interpretation that that will continue to happen, uh, to improve the service, to add services, etc. Specifically for EO4GEO, um, if we speak about the Copernix services, then most of them already include uh, in the platform, it's not only applications, it's not only to have access to the data to do something with it, but they provide also usually uh, a series of tools. And for example, in the context of EOFGO, on the land monitoring service, we will use them in different training actions and some of the curricula designed, uh, where also uh, the trainers, uh, the, the professors or the tutors can include and use these tools to offer to the students uh, better insights to the data and to use the data in exercises, et cetera. So already partially that's happening there and it's available, but if you ask, are, will there be new uh, services and virtual machine services? Of course, that's a very particular question and that one is maybe more also for me, more difficult to answer. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Danny, and, and, and thank you, Maria. And actually, uh, on the topic of how to find the data and, and how to find infrastructure for processing the data. Uh, that's one of the topics of the Eyes on Earth uh, Roadshow uh, that we're having uh, today and tomorrow. So I'd say stay tuned and uh, tune in to some of the sessions that are specific about, uh, for example, the DIASAs who are um, who are presenting themselves uh, for, the, for this particular purpose. Um, I have another question that is related to something that uh, that most of you brought up in in your introduction, and that is uh, that is COVID nineteen. It's a question from Ann Johnson, specifically aimed at, uh, at Professor Kushan and um, and uh, Danny again. Um, with the work from home due to COVID, uh, is this change to digital work locations affecting the globalization of jobs? Will will this continue after COVID? In other words, will work be less location dependent and more? digital, more remote. Um, okay, this uh, COVID situation uh, gives us opportunity to test the ability to work from home. And we, I think that we succeed to have no interruption in our work. And it shows us that uh, we can work 
wherever we are. And also, that only depends on the people and their uh, team of work. And we, even though the COVID situation stopped a lot of things, we have a bigger uh, work to do because a lot of things we have to solve. And also the projects are should be changed uh, because of this COVID situation and the, the efforts and uh, uh, needs to work were bigger. And I think we solve it on a very uh, successful uh, way. And uh, I can say that we are proud that we can say during this COVID situation, the, we employ five more people working on our projects because uh, of the needs to solve all these things, uh, not in a side of the company. And uh, I think it is it was a very good experience for us and show us a lot uh, how we can do uh, in more in, in the future. And also I, I saw in this our example that uh, there is a very big opportunity to employ people uh, from abroad, from all over the world to work for you. And if you need, and if you have possibilities to do that. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, Danny, would you like to, uh, to add to this? Yeah, maybe very briefly, I, I agree that certainly uh, everything changed and already there are big discussions in general, not only at the university, that also after COVID-19, probably we will work more at home. Uh, also, the teaching will done at distance. That happened already before COVID-19, by the way, but now it has been uh, deployed massively. Uh, so KLF, for example, has 60,000 students. Um, it is possible, technically speaking, whether it's, um, well, whether the people are happy with it to be not be able to see each other, that's another matter, I think. So I think we will uh, evolve towards a, a mixed situation, um, and but at least it will have an influence and will be more uh, work from home, uh, more teaching, a distance, etc. And these things are now nowadays possible. Uh, in the teaching, by the way, we saw this already in the success of the, the MOOCs. Um, the MOOCs are attracting many international students that you otherwise would never uh, reach, of course. Uh, some courses, even more technical courses, reach 30,000 students additionally on top of the, the regular students, but that are, of course, very uh, well delineated courses, uh, but it's all possible. So that will happen more and more, I guess. Uh, and COVID has just speed up things, in my opinion. But personally, I hope we can also go back and have more physical meetings again and visit Zagreb and other places to have conferences and project meetings, of course. Okay, well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not on mute. Sorry, I thought I was on mute. Um, I'm not. Um, uh, thank you very much for that uh, for that insight. Now we have uh, we have quite a long list of additional questions for which we uh, have run out of time right now. Um, um, however, I'm I'm hoping that if you stay tuned in to the to the conference going forward, uh, many of your questions will still be answered in uh, in different sessions. Uh, but for now, I would like to uh, um, to thank my panelists for all your insights and for the variety of uh, of questions that you have uh, been able to help us answer. Look at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats of the industry, and, and give us a broad overview of uh, of the challenges um, ahead. So thank you for your time spent with us on this important topic. Thank you, of course, to all our attendees for listening, for interacting with us, for sending us your questions. Uh, again, please don't forget to post your further questions, your learnings, your ideas on social media uh, using uh, hashtag 
EOE Roadshow, uh, uh, Eyes on Earth Roadshow, so EOE Roadshow. Um, so uh, I would like to close by uh, thanking you again for your attention and, and please check the, the, the website links in your email to find the start time and the links for your next session. Thank you very much.